Thank you very much. And great. Thank you for all for being here. I, I should actually say, if anyone does need to go and vote, you probably better leave quite soon. So, so but, um, but I hope lots of people will be staying to, uh, to hear a few more talks. Um, so I'm going to pick up where Diane's left and um, talk a little bit. I'm not going to... Diane's done a great explanation of some of the problems of, uh, of GDP as a measure of production. Um, there's also lots of problems of, of it as a measure of, of quality of life, which in a way it's often used as, or at least a measure of living standards. It's, um, economists and statisticians would say you should never do that, but, that, but um, often that's how it's treated. If you think about, um, we've heard about, a lot about the um, statistics put on buses um, in the referendum to de um, over the last few months, but if you think about a lot of the statistics that have been discussed in the referendum, a lot of them have been about, they've been about money, they've been the 350 million uh, a week, um, or they've been, but in particular, they've been about the forecast in terms of growth rates. Um, you know, is, is leaving the EU going to increase, um, you know, how much is it going to affect the economy positively or negatively? And to be honest, probably if we do vote to leave, that will be one of the first times in history where the public has voted for something where they think it's going to have a negative impact on the economy, because pretty much always people uh, follow the money. Um, the Scottish referendum, I guess, is a good example of that, where people were scared to leave because they thought of the impacts on the economy. Um, another example, and, and actually it's worth highlighting that a lot of those debates don't even have to use the word, the, those three special letters, GDP. They can just talk about the, what's going to happen to the economy in quite abstract terms, often without even the number. So the influence of GDP is sometimes a little bit hidden. Um, here's an example of when it's not hidden. Um, uh, it's quite explicit. This is, um, this is something we stumbled across uh, last year. Uh, this is a policy starter pack for, civil, for those entering the civil service, which says, talks about all the things that you should do when you join the civil service, all the things you should do as a good policymaker. And then it says, following these principles, we will help, it, will help you ensure that your policy achieves the outcomes that ministers want, whichever minister you might be in, while supporting the government's broader objectives to support business and growth. So that means that every policymaker in any department, be it Department for Environment or Department for Health or Department for Education, um, they've got the goals they've got within their ministry, but always they've also got to think about business and growth. So I guess an example of how GDP and growth is sort of everywhere in policy and how it influences everything that any policymaker is doing. Uh, so how do we escape from this grip? Um, here are some, um, the ex um, as Diane said, there have been uh, attempts to question GDP for a long time. Um, perhaps since the 60s, which is not very long after GDP started existing. So you know, as soon as it was born, it was uh, that people were already trying to find replacements. Um, here are a few examples. Um, on the left, you've got um, the Canadian Index of Wellbeing um, and the Oxfam Humankind Index. Those are both coming from civil society. Um, and they're both sort of single indicators, um, which are sort of posing, posing a chance to GDP. On the right, you've got um, some official um, things going on there. You've got the Office for National Statistics measuring national well-being wheel, which has about 50 indicators. Um, and you've got the, um, the, uh, the, the, new, the newcomer on the scene um, after many hundreds of debates and conversations, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which actually still doesn't exist. You've got 17 goals there, but I think there's about, supposed to be about 180 indicators underneath that. So, um, obviously, if you are trying to make important policy decisions and trying to decide uh, on, on detailed policy, um, which of those are you going to go for? Probably you're going to start looking at those two. Um, but actually, if we want to change, if we want to think about how numbers influence pol public rhetoric, if we want to think about how numbers shift debates, um, then they have problems. Um, I haven't come across anyone during the referendum um, doing any predictions about whether Brexit would lead, the, the, what Brexit would do to our 50 um, wellbeing indicators. And, and if they did, I don't think it would have been picked up very much in the media. Um, how do you explain it? Um, you know, this indicator was going to go up, that one's going to go down, this, it's, it's too much. And even if you were to, su to summarise it and you were to say something like 40 indicators would go down, 10 would go up, or we, shouldn't, we shouldn't leave, that would be misleading. Because the taps, perhaps the 10 that would go up if we left would actually be the ones that are most important. So, you, even, so if you don't, even if you don't try and bring them together, the public or the media or someone is going to try and synthesise that data into a single headline story. And so if you don't do it for them, then they'll do it in, some, in, in their own way and they're probably going to make a pig's ear out of it. Um, so, so, so that's why I would argue that these things, whilst they're going to be very useful for policy makers, are never going to change the public discourse. They're never going to shift us away from um, a focus on GDP growth as the main objective. Um, and that's why the other kinds of approaches, for all their flaws, need to be, need to be thought about. 
But single indicators do have many flaws. Um, they, um, they hide trade-offs. So, for example, we at the New Economics Foundation developed the Happy Planet Index, um, which measures, um, measures um, life expectancy and well-being and looks at how efficiently countries achieve that per unit of ecological footprint, of, of ecological resource. Um, we'll be publishing a new one next month. And we think it's a great campaigning tool, but we wouldn't want policymakers to use that as their headline indicator to decide what to do. Because you could increase HPI, for example, by, um, by, reducing, your, uh, you could, by reducing ecological footprint drast drastically and having uh, some impact on your, uh, on your life expectancy. So, um, so the trade-offs you know, trade are hidden in there. You can't really sort of, it's, it's, very, it's very hard to work them out. Um, and there's often potentially complex methodology. The Canadian Index of Wellbeing has 50 indicators. If I say the Canadian Index goes up, it's like, oh, but why? And it's like, well, well it's actually quite hard to explain. So it hides a lot of things. So we took a step back and we thought, okay, well, hang on. Maybe we are not giving the public enough, uh, enough dues. Maybe not giving them enough credit. Maybe thinking that they can only handle one number is a little bit, a, a little bit unfair. And if you think about some of the debates you see around, um, around, the, around the last 10 years, well, last five years or so, in terms of policy, yes, people talk about growth all the time, but they do also talk about unemployment. Uh, in the past, they talked a lot about inflation. And in recent years, um, the deficit has been one of the key figures. So it seems like people are able to handle four or so numbers. And we thought, OK, let's go for five. Um, why five? Um, so one, there's psychological evidence that people can handle five digits, so they can remember five numbers quite easily. But more importantly, um, if you talk to people who are experts on facilitation, for example, in workshops, and you ask them, how, how, you know, how do you do these workshops, people often talk about, well, let, we break people into groups of five or six to discuss things, and then we come back to plenary. Why five or six? Because we can all handle about five or six stories in our heads, which is more important than numbers, it's stories. So I can sit around a table with, four or, with five or six other, four or five other people, I guess, and I can somehow capture each of their stories in my head and go, okay, well, this person cares about that, but this person thinks we should do this. Um, Any more, it starts not becoming a discussion, it starts becoming um, you know, a plenary debate, which, where you don't really get a sense of what people are thinking. Um, so we thought, okay, with that in our, he that in our head, we need to get down the num a number to something like five. We went, went about trying to decide what those five would be. Um, we did that through a process of lots of stakeholder engagement. We looked, at, reviewed other indicator projects, and we looked at some of the consultations people have done um, in, in the UK in particular, because we were focusing on the UK here, about what the public think is important. So we looked at the ONS's consultation, Oxfam had done one, and the OECD had done a sort of consultation um, that we used as a consultation anyway. And we came up, I'm not going to go into the details, but we came up with five indicators. Um, a measure of good jobs, so not unemployment, but a measure of how many people are in, are in good jobs, which we defined as being secure, paying the living wage. Um, a measure of well-being, and we used, uh, we used the ONS data on average life satisfaction. Um, a measure of uh, our impact to the environment, and we focused on carbon emissions here. Um, so how, how are we doing in terms of our target, in terms of reducing carbon emissions? Um, a measure of fairness, so there we look at um, income inequality, the difference between the top and bottom, and a measure of health, um, the percentage of deaths that could have been avoided um, through, um, through good quality healthcare or public health interventions. Um, none of this is rocket science. We, we, we did have to do some maths and, 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 and our own calculations for a couple of them, the health and the good jobs one, and, sorry, and the environment one as well, but the wellbeing and fairness statistics you can find very readily, and none of it required any sort of new data collection. Um, and as I say, in a way, the five isn't important. Um, this was just our, you know, which, what they are exactly isn't important. This is just our attempt to kind of give an example. Um, oh, that's noisy. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, our, and, our, and our ask with this is to say, well, okay, ONS, for example, um, you know, it's great that you've done the Measuring National Wellbeing Wheel, but it's not catching on. People don't really know about it. What you need to do is produce five indicators um, with, uh, with a regular basis. You need to produce them as quickly as you do GDP, so people don't say, "Oh, well, it's great that well-being. Uh, sorry, it's great that um, inequality um, fell, but that was in 2012. We don't know what's happened since then." Um, so you need to have timely data. So basically, we're saying put some resource into measuring these things quickly and regularly and reliably, and then we can actually start having a more of a fair debate, so that we're not just talking about GDP all the time. Um, the ONS have said they'll think about it. Um, <laughs> um, the Welsh government actually has been quite keen, and they are talking about having five indicators, um, five headline indicators as part of their sustainability strategy. 
Um, and we've had quite a lot of interest, um, particularly on the good jobs indicator, from various people. So we've heard um, Andy Haldane from the Bank of England, England talking about it. We've heard a few MPs mention them in questions. Um, so th that indicator in particular has, has picked up some kind of interest. Um, we think it's important to get a big base around this, and I think this is the last point I want to mention. How does civil society fit in? So we're, we're a think tank. We're part of, we consider ourselves part of civil society. We're a charity. Um, obviously, a lot, of the, um, a lot of the stakeholders we've been engaging with are, are in that space as well. But we have engaged with lots of other people as well. And um, when, we, when, we, when we launched the, the, the five handling indicators, we had a bunch of people sign up and support it, um, including uh, union, uh, unions um, and a few businesses, Kingfishers being Q, for example. Um, ice cream. We were going to have ice cream at the launch event. Unfortunately, that didn't happen um, because Parliament didn't have a freezer or something along those lines <laughs> that we could use. Um, so, so we've managed to get some support around this. But to be honest, it's not been straightforward. Um, so we've got Greenpeace on there um, and RSPB, but there's a couple of environmental organized NGOs that we um, that have been on this agenda a long time, and we would have thought we would be able to get support, who we couldn't get to sign on to it. Why? because we only had one environmental indicator when they wanted at least two. Um, and our judgment call was that if you think about the public in general, the public don't think of environment as being worth two out of five. They would, they would give it one out of five, if anything. Um, so we decided to only have one environmental indicator. So we didn't get their support. Perhaps if we put one of those environmental indicators we might and, and put and taken out one of the others, let's say good jobs, we would have lost the unions. So. So there's a real challenge in terms of bringing, getting something together which everyone, um, which everyone supports. And GDP, I think, happened in a rare moment where there, were there was a political alignment, I guess, between, in a simple terms, between the left and right about what was important, um, and that was economic growth. And that's how GDP was able to, to, you know, to, capture, to capture the centre ground. And that's going to be a challenge to do. Um, the, other thing is to say, the other thing to say is even those that have supported it um, uh, and, and have put time and, time and, uh, and engagement into it still find it hard to actually say, okay, well, actually, we're going to put in a huge chunk of money into alternative indicators. Oxfam has. Oxfam has put lots of work into that. Um, but, few other, but few other NGOs have done that. Why? Because whilst they get the idea that we need to shift the focus away from GDP, that maybe if we were counting something other than GDP, we'd care more about the environment or we'd, you know, we'd value volunteering more or there'd be, less, um, you know, there'd be less advertising to children or whatever it may be that they care about. They all get those different links but they don't see them as central, central enough to their uh, mission. And so how do we get the idea that shifting what we measure, shifting how we, how we vision progress, is actually a core to, to shifting how we do politics? That's, that's the challenge that we see. Um, so um, without, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.